Welcome to the Precious Testimonies broadcast. I'm Norm Rasmussen, your host. In the Old Testament book of Psalm, chapter 96, verse 3, it reads, Declare God's glory among the nations. Well, we believe God has put a call on this ministry to do just that. Share publicly what Jesus Christ has been doing in the lives of people. And you're going to be listening to some people testifying on this broadcast of what God has done in their lives. They're going to be sharing what Jesus Christ means to them. There are many, many, many people who are looking for answers about God. Is God real? Is God alive? Well, if God is real and God is alive, what am I supposed to believe about him? Well, my friend, I pray that you would take the time to listen to how people on this broadcast will be sharing some of the common struggles that all people face. And they have come to a conclusion that Jesus Christ not only is God, but because he laid down his life, for each and every person on this planet died in their place, taking their punishment so their sins might be forgiven, not held against them on the judgment day, that they might be with God for eternity, experiencing eternal joy and peace with Him. I pray you take the time to listen to these real-life God stories. What a blessing they are. Welcome to Precious Testimonies. I'm Norm Rasmussen, the privileged founder of this non-denominational outreach ministry. I want to share an experience that I had with God, or God gave me, back in 1984. Other than becoming born again, my born again experience, which is the most precious experience I've ever had with God, the second most important experience that I ever had with God, a supernatural encounter, if you will, was in 1984. Now, I got saved back around 1980, 81, uh, and it was a few years later that God gave me this supernatural experience or encounter with Him. It was a revelation of God's unconditional love for me and for everyone. And so this is very important for people to hear if they've never got a confident grasp on just how much God loves them. Just how much God accepts them, in other words. God loves unconditionally. And I'm going to make my best attempt <clears throat> to first tell my story and then secondly do some follow-up and explaining as best as I'm able to help people understand the importance of seeking God to get revelation from Him however He wants to impart it to them so they too can get clear understanding of how much God loves each of us unconditionally. You may be, you may not even be a Christian. And of course our call is to reach out and to try to be used of God to help people come to the salvation knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But we are also being used of the Lord to help Christians grow in their relationship with Jesus Christ. And so this probably is a message for young Christians, young born-again Christians who have yet, like I was, to be able to comprehend the importance, the critical importance of understanding God's unconditional love for us. And you're going to hear about that some as I share my own personal story. But before getting into that, just let me share here in Ephesians in the New Testament, in the book of Ephesians chapter 6, starting with verse 10 through about 18, 
we read about the weapons of our warfare. The weapons that God has provided Christians to keep the devil from uh, and influencing them to the degree where uh, it is robbing them of their joy, their peace, in their relationship with Jesus Christ. And uh, though I'm not going to be saying a whole lot uh, about these weapons because I've written about that in other places on our website and said some things on video about that, um, it does say in verse 17 of verse 6, And take the helmet of salvation... Take the helmet of salvation. That is the that is our weapon where we protect our thought life. God is saying, use the weapon I give you to protect your thought life. Because Satan has been given latitude by God to try to manipulate our thinking. All of us are being manipulated in one degree or another by Satan's darts that he's firing into our minds in the spirit realm. And the spirit realm has power over us humans to uh, manipulate our thought life. The, the demonic powers are constantly working on behalf of Satan to manipulate our thought lives and they do that primarily by lying to us they lie to us covertly trying to get us to agree with those lies and those lies are always leading us away from the truth that God wants us understanding and is recorded in the Holy Bible Satan ha is doing everything he can to keep people from understanding God's unconditional love for them. Especially Christians, because once they get a handle on God's unconditional love for them, they are far more equipped uh, to deal with what's going on in their minds and take according take appropriate action to stop it okay uh, I should go on there and read just a little bit more in case you're not familiar with um, what God has to say let me just let me do let me just do that before we go any further here uh, verse 17 of verse 6 and take the helmet of salvation the sword of the spirit which is the word of God I just shared that the word of God use that to uh, let the Holy Spirit uh, control your thought life. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit, being watchful to the end. Up, 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 up. I'm sorry. That's too far. Let's go back to verse 15. And having your, your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all, <coughs> in verse 16, above all, excuse me, <coughs> above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. Okay, the shield of faith is appropriating God's word for each and every situation we're dealing with, and that is appropriating the helmet of salvation. The, the, the shield of faith is an offensive weapon, and that is to protect the fiery uh, darts manipulating or attempting to manipulate our thought lives okay and the helmet of salvation is uh, God is simply trying to say there protect your thought life put the armor that I provide for you upon your mind symbolically so the enemy can't do your thinking for you because ultimately the battle <clears throat> that we face down here is a battle of words. It is a battle of words and God is trying to get us to believe his words and Satan is trying to get us to believe his words. And that all happens in our minds. 
Okay, and that battle goes on 24-7. It's going to continue right up until the time that Jesus comes back and uh, locks Satan up in prison where he no longer can manipulate our thoughts. Okay, till that time happens, we have a spiritual battle on our hands, and uh, it's all in who we are going to listen to as to what we believe, what we think about, and what we believe. And God wants us to believe what he says about us in his word. He wants us to believe what he says in this word about himself. He truly does. That's his way of helping us set our minds on things above. Well, let's get to the story. Probably would... uh, help a little bit for me to share with you that I did not grow up in a loving environment. Uh, I thank God that I had a father and mother that were there growing up. Many children don't. But they had no concept of God's unconditional love for them. And so their whole understanding of of love was uh, it was conditional and they weren't in an environment to get much conditional love from each other they hated each other they fought constantly uh, and I give them five gold stars and an attaboy and attagirl for hanging in there but they were handicapped they were wounded people like so many others lived and died never getting a handle on God's unconditional love for them because they didn't have a handle on God's unconditional love for them, they didn't know how to demonstrate it or pass it along to us six children raised uh, by them. And that is the experience that I found. For people who don't understand God's unconditional love for them, all that is left is performance. And that's where Satan loves to keep us in, performance. If you do this, I will love you. If you don't do this, I won't love you. That's basically what conditional love is. And so we get into marriages uh, of two people who don't understand God's unconditional love. And love begins to, well, if you do such and such, I'll love you. And if you don't do such and such, I will quit loving you. And pretty soon we have pain in the relationship where it's all based on quicksand. God does not want us functioning in this life with conditional love. He wants us functioning in unconditional love. So, when I got born again, radically born again by God, when I was age 35, I was doing the best I knew to do and God was making huge changes in my life. I was growing into the new creation that God says I had become, a new spiritual creation, uh, as all born-again Christians are, that God says uh, they are. Well, things have passed away, new things have come, but it was a progression. Uh, and so I, I, there came a time Again, uh, it was in 1984, maybe growing into 1985. I don't remember exactly now, but let's keep it simple, in 1984. On my job, I did did quite a bit of driving on my job, though I got out of my truck and did boots on the ground as well. But on my job, I found myself doing something that I did not do a great deal back in those days, and that was just praising the Lord with spiritual songs and just my own creative words over and over. Uh, Father, thank you. Jesus, I love you. Praise you, Lord. And I was singing songs of praise, trying to do my job, but these this this desire to praise and thank God kept welling up in me. Now it started slow, but as the hours and days progressed, it become uncontrollable in me. After 
two, three, four, five days roughly. It began. It kept growing to the point where it was becoming a distraction. Now, what was very interesting about this, because this was not me, I, this wasn't me, uh, I was doing this in my sleep as well. And I was having a hard time sleeping because something inside of me just wanted to sing songs of praise and thanksgiving to my God, to our Lord Jesus Christ, to our Heavenly Father, my Heavenly Father. And it came to the point where I realized I really couldn't do my job. I really could not focus on my job, and I needed to be focused on my job to do it right. And so I told my wife, Kathleen, I said, Honey, I don't know what's going on with me, but I've, I've just, I, I'm going to take a couple of vacation days or maybe more and, and get alone with God. I just feel like I want to get alone with God and do nothing but praise Him. I don't understand this. I've never experienced it before, never read about it, but I just know I'm being driven to get alone with God. I, I can't be distracted by work or anything else in my life. That's what i got to do. Well, she said, well, do what you got to do. And so I did. I, I called in, took some vacation days, uh, and um, this was in the springtime here in uh, southern Michigan area, southwestern Michigan, Grand Rapids area. And I, um, I had, a, had an old Plymouth Duster at the time. I don't remember what year it was. But uh, I drove that out uh, to an old two-track uh, out by a sewage plant, if I remember correctly, and it went out into some remote parts of that area where I could be alone. I just wanted to be alone without no distractions, and I seemed like a good enough spot to be. So I went down, shut the car off, and just sat there and was praising God in the quiet of my car. Um, and after an hour or so, I was getting cramped in this car, and so I needed to get out and stretch. And so I got out and I walked down the little two-track dirt road a ways and just stood there, uh, standing there, arms lifted, praising God. Jesus, I love you, Father. I thank you, Holy Spirit. I love you. And, I, you know, just praising, praising the Trinity of God. Uh, and, you know, praising Jesus a great deal, and the Father a great deal. And I was totally content to stand there lifting my arms, praising the Lord for the rest of my life. It, it's like, it, it, I don't have the words to describe how consumed I was in desiring to praise the Lord. It wasn't something I felt I God forced me to do. He didn't ask me to do it. It's just something I wanted to do. And it just seemed so right to do. Uh, that's beyond, that's about all I can say about it. Uh, I just don't have the words to say how consumed I was with just wanting to stand and praise God the rest of my life. And so I stood there, I don't know how long it was, half hour, 45 minutes, an hour, praising the Lord in that position. And then out of nowhere, God spoke so clearly to me and these are the words he said norm you're trying to earn my love it's impossible no one can earn my love it's free well the whole desire to praise God just shut down and it's like I'm stunned. First and foremost, God just spoke to me. Uh, there was no doubt in my mind God spoke to me. And it's like I'm trying to earn. I begin to think about what he just said. I'm trying to earn God's love? How? I, I don't get it. You know, what do you mean? And it wasn't condemnation. It was kind of a, you know, it was a gentle voice that I heard God speak. I don't know. It wasn't audible. It was in my spirit, of course. His spirit was speaking to my spirit, but it was so loud, it was like it could have been audible, though it wasn't. But it was loud, and it was not my own voice, and I knew it was the voice of God. And so I responded to him, Lord, I, I didn't understand. What do you mean I'm trying to earn your love? I, I, I don't understand. And again, he spoke very clearly the whole time. 
he uh, from here forth when I say he spoke I could hear him as clear as you can hear me right now okay I mean it was that clear and he says Norm you're trying to earn my love by doing ministry now you gotta you gotta understand I, I, I was I've been a doer from day one I've always been a doer and uh, I've learned to be a beer over the years of walking with the Lord, but I still was put on this earth to be a doer. And we were trying to do some evangelistic ministry of sort way back at that time. And I was very thankful to be able to do it to help advance the kingdom of God in the lives of others, as Matthew 6.33 uh, exhorts us to do. And, and God said, you're trying to earn my love by doing the call that I've given you to do on your life. And we were publishing testimonies in a little track form, a little pocketbook form, putting those out and around and about. People could find them. And I said, I am. And he said, yes, you are. And he said, the money that you are sowing into my kingdom work so that other ministries can... Uh, have financial resources to do what I've called them to do you're giving money with the expectation that I will love you more that's not how you're going to get my love he said you're reading your Bible as you read your Bible uh, you're doing that to try to get more of my love when you pray, you're trying to get more of my love. Everything you're doing spiritually, when you go to church, you're trying to, on Sundays and, you know, any other time, you're trying to get my love. When you witness to others the good news of the gospel, you're trying to earn my love. And I said, Lord, wow, wow, I didn't know, I had no idea. And he said, well, that's why I am speaking to you right now. Uh, you've, you've had this desire to praise and worship me and that was my means of getting you into the spirit so you could be walking in the spirit so you could hear me plainly as you're able to hear me plainly right now. That, that was necessary for you to get out of your carnal uh, state of mind into a spiritual state of mind where I could speak to you clearly like this. And praise and worship, I learned yet later, is one of the best ways to accomplish that. But let's get on with the story. So, uh, I, when God said that I was trying to earn his love and it was impossible, I went from bringing my hands down, I went to down on my knees... Uh, I think I was bending down on one leg, if I remember correctly. Maybe I was both knees on the ground. I don't know for sure. And uh, and down in that position, uh, God began to talk to me, as I just shared with you. And while I was down there on the ground on my knees uh, in the old dusty two-track road, he says, Norm, let me tell you about, uh, well, let me rephrase that. He began to walk me through an exercise to help me understand. And maybe this will help somebody, okay? He then, he said, Norm, do you know that if you never did ministry from this day forward, the ministry I've called you to do, I wouldn't love you any less. I said, you wouldn't? He says, no. He said, do you know that if you never gave one penny, one dime, one dollar to the, to the work of ministry to help others do the kingdom of God that I've called to do, that wouldn't cause me to love you any less? No, I didn't know that. He said, you know that if you never pray from this moment forward, you never talk to me, you never pray to me, it won't cause me to love you any less. I, it won't. No, it won't. He said, you know, if you never read your Bible from this moment forward till the rest of your life is done, all through your life, it won't cause me to love you anything any less. All of those spiritual disciplines that you do, the things that Christians 
say is good. You know, the Christian teachers tell other young Christians, this is good for you. Do these things. Sow your money into the kingdom work. You reap if you, you know, you, you sow what you reap. So if you don't sow financial blessings into the kingdom work, don't expect God's financial blessings and favor to be put on your life. Um, if you don't, in other words, you know, it's been said, you get out of this Bible what you put into it. So if you're not reading it or hearing it or both, <laughs> you're not getting a thing out of it. Uh, if you never pray, you'll never hear God. You'll never see God really move in your life. Praying is the most precious um, thing that God has given us. Be able to talk with God and have confidence that he's hearing. So these are precious disciplines, but he said, if you don't do any of these, it won't cause me to love you any less. It won't cause me to love anybody any less. And I'm stunned. I mean, I'm stunned. And then he says, you know how I can do this? I said, no, I don't know. How can you do this? And he says, because of my nature and be, because of his attributes, okay, it's one of his godly attributes. It took me years later to understand. But he says, I can do this because of the, because of the death of, and burial and resurrection of my son, Jesus Christ, from the foundation of the world. In other words, before any human being was ever created, God had in his mind the death of Jesus Christ coming to earth, living a sinless life, going to the cross, dying for each and every person's sins on this planet, and then defeating Satan's power over the human race. And so he resurrected and went back to heaven. I didn't understand that at that time. Many years have passed. I'm still trying to understand it and hardly can grasp it, though I accept it. What God accomplished for humanity by dying on the cross in our place, taking our punishment so that our sins won't be held against us once we die. There is a revelation to be had by the atonement of Jesus Christ on the cross that we will never get this side of eternity, I'm fully persuaded. But I heard God say, I can love you unconditionally because of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And because you've invited Jesus Christ to come and live inside of you, truly, it is Christ in you that equips and enables me. And we're, we're talking about God the Father speaking here, okay? I didn't know that who it was at first, but once I came to my senses and realized this was God the Father. This was the person of God the Father speaking to me. And, and he was saying uh, that it is Christ in you that I love. It is Christ in you I accept. Okay? I didn't get it. I didn't comprehend that. I'm beginning to comprehend it many years later. Okay? But, so at any rate... I, uh, I, uh, I just started, I was bawling like a baby. I, 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 I couldn't believe what I was hearing. And I just told God, you mean if I don't give you one penny the rest of my life on this earth, you won't, it won't cause you to love you any less? Nope. And he says, speaking of that, he says, you know, for, you know, you're, for all of these Christians who keep drumming money, money, money and coming up with every kind of, snake oil uh, promise and threat and anything in between that you got to give, you got to give, you got to give. He says, you think money will buy salvation for you? Forgiveness of your sins, in other words? No. My answer was no. He said, do you think giving money will keep you saved, keep you forgiven of your sins? No. No. You think giving a million dollars in the offering plate would save your soul? 
In other words, have me forgive you of your sins? No. You think putting a million dollars in the offering plate every Sunday after you become saved is going to keep you saved? No. <laughs> no. Then just keep money in perspective. Money will not save your soul and money will not keep your soul. It is believing what I have said in my word that saves you. Okay, that the death, burial, and resurrection of my son Jesus Christ, that's what saves you and keeps you saved. Believing it was that complete, okay, it was that perfect of a sacrifice. That's what gets you saved and that's what keeps you saved. And don't confuse what saves you and keeps you saved. Reading the Bible doesn't save you. Going to church doesn't save you. Praying doesn't save you. Doing ministry doesn't save you. Giving money doesn't save you. And it doesn't even keep you saved once you're saved. Those are just good things to do. Those are all a part of equipping you to be an effective minister or vessel that I can use to help advance the kingdom of God, the lordship, the salvation and lordship of Jesus Christ in the lives of others, in other words, okay? And so, and those are the good works that I would desire that every Christian does. Uh, let me take a little sidebar here. We're not saved by our spiritual good works. We're saved to do good works spiritual works. Now Satan has twisted that all around and people are confused, especially in the cults and paracults, that you have to do certain spiritual disciplines to be sure that you're okay with Jesus Christ and sure that he'll accept you when you die, sure that you'll get to heaven. Ah, Satan has so penetrated the minds of spiritual folks in this arena. None of that will get you saved or keep you saved. Now, I didn't comprehend it as that moment in time that I comprehend it now because I've had, you know, nearly 30 years as of this taping to understand God and his nature and what Satan has lied to us and the lies we've believed from Satan. But staying with a story here now, I thought, wow. You know, and then God, then God, uh, I got to stop here and, and say now. You know, God then began to share with me. He says, Norm, now, if you don't want to pray, if you don't want to sow money into my kingdom work, if you never want to read your Bible, if you never want to attend a local church fellowship, where other Christians meet, where uh, you can be taught spiritual things that are good for you, and where I can use you to minister to others who need uh, what I want to give them through you, you're the one that's going to come up short, because that involves eternal rewards. Uh, you know that Jesus says, don't lay up rewards on, on earth, where moth and rust destroy, but lay up treasures in heaven. So, for yourselves, okay, lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. So, if you're only going to sow a little prayer, only going to read a, the word a little bit, if you're only going to avail yourself to be used in ministry a little bit, if you're only going to, you know, sow a little money into the kingdom of God, on the reward day, don't be whining and complaining when you come up short uh, on the rewards that I give to you when other Christians are going to get a whole lot more. Because that's all a part of what I have planned for Christians as well. So, but don't do any of that, okay, thinking that you're going to get more of my love. Don't confuse eternal rewards with getting more of my love. I love each and every person, sinner to saint. Listen up, friend. He says, I love every person, sinner to saint. That means non-Christian as well as Christian. I love them equally the same because of what Jesus Christ accomplished on the cross before the foundation of the world. He went on to explain now, 
that unconditional love for the unsaved won't keep them out of hell. My unconditional love will not keep any human being from going to hell. Because my unconditional love is just one of my many divine godly attributes. Now it took me some years to fully grasp what he was saying here. But he says, I am an all, I'm an all loving God. I'm an unconditional loving God. And that's what we're talking about primarily here. But he said, I'm also a just God. I'm a holy God and I'm a just God. Those are my divine attributes as well. My divine godly characteristics, if you will, as well. And every one of my attributes must be adhered to by my created beings. And so when my created beings sin against me, judgment will be pronounced by me because I will not tolerate um, rebels, lawbreakers. When somebody breaks my spiritual laws, they receive punishment from me. And so for every human being that's born on planet Earth, born with the sin nature they inherited, inherited from Adam and Eve, that sin separates them from me right at birth. And the only provision that I've given humanity to have that separation removed is the sacrifice of myself upon that cross over 2,000 years ago now, roughly. Okay, That removed the barrier that existed because of sin. And so, if a person doesn't reach out and grab hold of the free gift of pardon that I've provided humanity, and they die in their sins, my divine holiness says justice must be served. And punishment is the only course left for me punish people for their wrongdoing against me and others. So because God's an all just God, he must execute judgment uh, toward those who have sinned and hence they will be separated from God for all eternity. That is the part of the Christian message. Okay. And so so God's unconditional love doesn't keep anybody out of hell. God's unconditional love doesn't pardon anyone from their sins. Wow, wait a minute. Hold on here. What does pardon people then from God's execution of wrath or punishment against their sins by becoming one in Jesus Christ. By asking Jesus Christ to forgive you of your sins, cleanse you from all unrighteousness, and come in and be Lord and Savior of their life. So that when you ask, he does come in. He comes in. Not by feeling. He just comes in. And by faith, you now believe that God lives inside of you. And because he is worthy, Part of understanding this is impossible until you go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. Let me read that for you. Uh, I know I'm chopping this up a little bit, but the Holy Spirit has a way of communicating far more effectively than I do. Uh, 2 Corinthians 5, verse 21 says... For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Okay, what's God saying here? I'm going to have to take a little stop because we got a demon in our cat meowing. I'm sure you can hear that. And it's no coincidence that we got uh, this cat trying to interrupt the flow of things here. Maybe he will silence. Maybe we can keep going. Maybe not. Okay, let's read this again. 
For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. What's God saying here? This is found in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 21. For God the Father made Jesus Christ, who never sinned once in his 33 years of living on this planet, for God the Father made Jesus Christ, who knew no sin, to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. In other words, when we accept Jesus Christ as our personal Lord and Savior, we get God's imputed righteousness to us. We get his holiness. We get his righteousness. And that is the holiness, that is a righteousness that literally saves us. That's the righteousness that God has given to born-again Christians free of charge. Okay, That's the righteousness that saves us. Because truth be known, no Christian can be holy enough or righteous enough in and of their own abilities that God will accept. It's impossible. And God knew that before he created the human race, before Adam and Eve sinned and fell, and before we received the uh, sin nature all the way back from Adam and Eve. This passed on through the bloodline, and we don't know spiritually how that's done. But it's been passed to us because Scripture says we're born sinners, and that's how we got it. And so uh, it is the imputed righteousness that God gives us in Christ Jesus when we invite him into our lives that gives us the holiness, the righteousness that God says every person must have before he will find them acceptable to remain with him in eternity. Okay? And though I didn't, all, uh, I didn't understand all of that back on that time, it really is supports and uh, explains why God kept saying, I can love people unconditionally, sinner to saint, because of the death, burial, and resurrection in Jesus Christ. Now, God went on to say to me, he says, Norm, that's how I can love people unconditionally. I love them unconditionally. I do not love their sin. I hate their sin. Okay? I hate their sin. Sin, I hate. But the person committing the sin, I love unconditionally. Now, that humanly makes no sense to us. I understand that. But God is God. And God is the one who is the judge. He's the one who's going to determine each of our eternity. And uh, so, if it's okay with him, then it should be fine with us. So, God's unconditional love for the unsaved will not keep them out of hell. That's very important. And no amount of spiritual doing will remove the sentence of eternal death that is upon every human being until they get that canceled. And the only way they can get that canceled is to accept the plan of salvation that God offers each and every one of us, and that is salvation, forgiveness of our sins, being made right with God, having the imputed holiness or righteousness given to us, totally free of charge, instantly, the moment that we are we invite Jesus Christ to be our Savior and Lord. Now, I need to do a little bit of teaching so that Satan doesn't twist this out of context for people hearing it. Our righteousness will never save us. Only God's imputed righteousness to us, given to us free of charge, is what saves us. But that's only half of the revelation of truth. God says, now that you're a Christian, now that you have the Holy Spirit's power working in you, walk out your righteousness. Walk it out. And so God expects those who belong to Jesus Christ to begin to get serious with sin in their life. Get rid of it. Work with me. Stop from giving in to temptations. That is the process called sanctification. And that God will reward each of us for. It doesn't motivate him 
to love us unconditionally more, but it certainly does motivate him to want to reward us more. Having the favor and blessing of God on our lives is God's nature, but he doesn't grant that until we walk in obedience to him. It's no different if you're a parent and your child rebels constantly against your authority, you don't want to reward that child. You want to withhold reward from that child until that child learns the importance of being obedient to what you desire that child to do, right? That makes sense. Well, God's the same way. He rewards those who are obedient to him. Well, how do I know how to be obedient to God? He's given us instructions in written form right here. It's in the New Testament Bible. Everything we need to know on how to please God and walk in obedience to Him is right here in the New Testament Bible. He's been very generous uh, to give us that. We don't need anything else other than the New Testament Bible to know what we need to do to walk in obedience to God to please Him our entire lives. Anything other than that might be a great resource to help understand it, but this is the source that God has provided. Now, I'm not discounting the Old Testament because the Old Testament helps us understand and appreciate the New Testament. Um, so, now, helps us understand the nature and character of God as well, okay? But I, I don't want to get off on that tangent. We can get off on a lot of tangents and already I've got off on a few and I'm trying to bring this back down. So, to the story and then share what I feel to share. And I've been sharing that along the way rather than wait till the very end. That's just I've been getting off into understanding of of God's unconditional love for us and uh, what that all might mean or what that does mean. So my friend, I was a new person after that. Uh, I became a radically new person after that encounter. What happened from all of that is, in, in a way that I could apply it, and, and I asked God, I asked God, I, I, in the hours and days that follow, I said, well, God, how do I walk this out? And he says, Norm, don't think of prayer as something you have to do. Think of prayer as something you get to do. Don't give money to the kingdom work because you're you think you're supposed to. Yeah, I know there's a lot of voices out there that's laying a guilt trip on Christians one way or another about tithing and the Malachi 310 and if you don't give, the devourer will get you and oh good Lord, it goes on and on. Satan's, Satan's favorite topic is tithing and money in Christianity and he has done such an effective job on mainline Christianity that it drives most people away from church rather than liberates them and attracts them to Christianity, I do believe, but I don't think God's going to let that stop somebody from receiving, finding, and receiving salvation. A lot of Christians are figuring it out. They'll go to church, they just leave their wallets at home. For church overseers who keep beating the drum of Malachi 3.10, 3.11, and throw a few other old covenant uh, scriptures that don't apply to the body of Christ today, okay, but let's get back to what God said. Don't give money because you're expected to, because everybody else around you thinks you're supposed to. No, you give money because you get to. You, you give a dime, you give a dollar to the work of my kingdom because you get to, not because you have to. Quit giving. Quit praying, quit giving, quit going to church, quit reading your Bible, quit doing everything. If you need to do that to have this revelation permeate your being that I love you unconditionally. Okay? That's what I'm trying to get you to understand. Don't do any of those things because you think you're supposed to or that's your responsibility or that's your obligation. Well, that just proves no, 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 no. Those, all that does is lay up rewards for you in heaven. That's what all of those things do. And sure, it motivates me to increase favor and blessing upon your life. 
but I'll withhold favor and blessing on your life until you get it. It's something you get to do, not something you have to do. A lot of Christians have tithes for years and years and years. They never talk about it, but inside, well, God, where's, where, when am I going to start receiving some return in this life for all the tithing I've done? I'm telling you right now, I've heard God say he's purposely withholding blessing from Christians who have been tithing for years and years and years maybe because they believed the lie through some well-meaning Christians that that's what a Christian is supposed to be doing. No, it's a lie from the pit of hell. It's something they get to do. In the Old Testament, it was something they were expected of God to do because that was the income tax. That's what the spiritual leaders lived on. Okay, they had no other financial resources. The Roman government sure didn't help finance them. The taxes that the Christians had to pay, pay went to the Roman government, didn't go to Christian authorities, uh, the priests, Okay, the spiritual leaders. So the tithe was to help the priest live and do their priestly duty so they didn't have to go out and get a job, okay, and be deluded in their ability to, to do God's uh, call on their life. Now, sure, the money we give now helps ministers be freed up, ministries and ministers be freed up so they don't have to be constantly trying to earn a dollar. Uh, so, so that they are minimized in their effectiveness in doing the call that God has put on their lives. Nothing's changed there. One is to help ministries and ministers do the, the call that God has put on their lives. Sure. But it's not something I have to do. It's not something I'm expected to do. It ain't something that God is telling Christians they should be doing. It's something they get to do. There's a huge difference between have to and get to. And that's where the devil constantly wants us thinking this is what I'm supposed to do. And then when I don't do it, I'm on these guilt trips. And then it goes right back to, well, I guess God maybe doesn't love me. See, that's what Satan is constantly trying to bring us to. So, see, God doesn't love you. See, God really doesn't love you. He doesn't love you. Because we can't keep up this performance mentality of I've got to, I've got to, I've got to, God wants me to, I'm expected to. Nope. God cut right through that and he said, you don't have to do any of that. And it will not, it will not cause me to reject you on the judgment day. You are saved as much if you do none of that. It will not cause you to lose your salvation if you stop giving money, stop praying, stop reading your Bible, stop going to church, stop doing ministry. It will not cause you to lose your salvation. Understand that. He told me that very clearly. It won't cause you to lose your salvation. You're secure in that as long as you continue to keep believing. My sacrifice on the cross is what saves you and you're continuing to believe it keeps you saved. Nothing else. Don't add to it. Nothing less. Nothing more. Okay. Yes, sir, God. And so that liberated me, my friend. It liberated me. When I got into the Bible, the amount of time that I spent in the Bible was no longer important anymore. Because now when I open up the Bible, I expected God to speak to me somehow, some way. I expected the Bible to be spiritual food, spiritual life, to feed my spirit and soul, which then causes the physical body to remain uh, healed. When I pray, now I don't feel any way that I need to pray five minutes, ten minutes, one hour, none of that. Now, I just pray when I want to talk to God. And when I found out I'm not expected to talk to God, and I don't have to talk to God, it makes me want to talk to God all the more. See, it, God set me free. Satan had me bound in this have to, supposed to Christianity. God freed me from that. It's a get to. See? 
and it, it was so liberating and it's remained and it, it's just caused me to be excited and want to tell the whole world about it because Satan so fights so hard in keeping people from understanding this because God wants every Christian to get it. He does. He wants everybody to realize the benefits of Christianity even before they're saved if they can possibly hear a message like this. Um, there's nothing better on this planet than God's unconditional love for us. It's the best thing there is once you can get a handle on it. And God wants us to get a handle on it. God wants us to seek him to get it. And get it as quickly as we can. And it goes back to the beginning. Once you comprehend how much God accepts you with all of your faults, with all of your character flaws, for all the things you've done wrong in the past, and for all the things you're going to do in the future, okay, that does not alter his unconditional love for us. It doesn't. And sure, uh, sinning against God does tend to motivate God to withhold blessing and favor from us. So there are consequences to sin. Don't, don't misunderstand that. God will definitely chastise and discipline those who are engaging in sin, who's missing the mark in some way, somehow. He brings a paddle out and whoops on our rear ends if it's, that's what he decides is necessary to get us to start walking in obedience in one or more areas. After his spirit has said, don't do that, don't do that, don't do that, don't do that, and we continue to do that, and... Keep writing on 1 John 1 9 asking forgiveness for the sin which he always grants. But if we continue to engage in one or more sins against him and or others or against our own temple that he is inside of, um, he disciplines those he loves. Okay, so that's another dimension. Uh, we, we get this idea, well, if God loves me unconditionally, then he never thinks uh, bad of me, right? No, God is not happy when we sin doesn't cause him to love us any less, but it certainly can cause him to be motivated to withhold favor and blessing. That's the nature of God. It always will be. Obedience pays huge dividends. So, my friend, I know that's a little bit chopped up, but uh, I spoke about this years earlier, and the, the sound didn't come out. I had some primitive uh, editing software, and the sound didn't come out that good, so I thought I would attempt to do some upgraded video on this where the sound is much better and um, so I do pray that God has will use this somehow some way to help you clearly be at peace and just so thrilled of knowing how much God loves each of us unconditionally in Christ Jesus it is Christ Jesus truly who is our hope of glory he is our all in all, and he lives in each and every one of us who have invited him to come and live inside of us. Yes, we would like to know more about his presence in us. God forces us to believe it by faith. But from time to time, he allows supernatural encounters to certain people to reinforce that he's living inside of us. And uh, what he wants us to realize more than anything is that when he looks at ye Christians, he doesn't look at our flaws. He doesn't see our character flaws. God the Father is looking at Christ in us. Because he knows it is Christ in us that is transforming us into his likeness. We get far more hung up on our character flaws than we should be. It's good to realize them so that we're motivated to let God change us into the likeness of Christ. But God the Father sees Jesus Christ in each of us who have asked Jesus Christ to come in and be our Savior and Lord. Jesus Christ does not live in any other human being who hasn't invited him to come in as Savior and Lord. The New Age types will try to convince you Christ is in every one of us. Not true. A lie from Satan. 
It's a lie from Satan. Christ Jesus only comes in to those who invite him in and are serious to mean business with him. That's very important. People who are going to mean business with Jesus Christ are the ones that Jesus takes up residence inside. And if they aren't walking in obedience, striving to walk in obedience to the New Testament roadmap, the New Testament instruction manual that God has given his people to live their lives by, they're playing games with themselves and God. Truly. So my friend, thanks for hearing me out. And uh, I pray that God would use this. Father, um, I can write better than I can speak, but you can take any words you want and use it however you want to. So I just pray, Father, that you give any hearers here who want to get a better handle on your unconditional love for them. I pray that you just give them supernatural revelation, understanding, so that they get it and get it clearly and speak it better, write about it better than I can so that others are out there understanding it and passing it along so other Christians can get it and get it well so that we are no longer tossed to and fro by Satan's manipulation of our thoughts. And uh, we need to constantly um, realize what you have to say about who we are in Christ Jesus. And I thank you, Father, for it in Jesus' name. I, I should say that um, at the bottom of the description of this video, there's a link there, maybe a couple of links, but I'm going to link you to a writing that uh, God has used me to put together. It's called, Who God the Father Says I Am in Christ. And... Uh, it is a written uh, document we have on our uh, Precious Testimonies website that many people are receiving from. It provides uh, a little bit of understanding about the importance of knowing our identity in Christ and then gives many scripture promises that God wants us to, to constantly dwell on because it's so important for us to get a handle on understanding who God says we are in our relationship with Jesus Christ. And so you can go to that writing. I really encourage you to uh, check that out. Uh, you need to know who you are in Christ to wage effective spiritual warfare against the attacks of Satan upon your mind. Every Christian needs to do that. Well, thank you again, and God bless you. Hey there, my name is Craig, and I finally got Tamara in the room with me here in our little corner of our little corner of the house. And... Um, as promised, we were going to give our salvation testimony. And, you know, as I've mentioned, we've created this channel here, O Church Arise, so that the church would um, be what the, what the world needs. Um, we, we need to do that. As we see our world becoming darker and darker, um, the church needs to rise up and be what she's supposed to be. And uh, we can't, you know, in many cases we have churches that are trying to make the world comfortable. And it's not helping the world, it's, it's doing more damage. Mm -hmm. And we need to be what the world needs. And so we've uh, started this channel. If you go to our main page, there's an introductory video that explains kind of the framework of the channel and um, <clears throat> how we're kind of, uh, what kind of categories we have, what we're talking about. And, um, and we thought if, if anybody's going to listen to this channel, they should have this testimony, our salvation testimony available so that you can see what God's done in our lives and see where we're coming from. Uh, that's very important. You know, when you join a church, you give your salvation testimony. They need to know that, you know, you're, you're kind of the real deal. And so, uh, and so that's why we're sitting here today. And uh, we want to tell you what God's done. This is, this is somewhat about us, but it's mainly and ultimately about God and what God has done in our lives. So um, just briefly, kind of a you know we've we've kind of gone from being a religious people to being people on fire for God and uh, loving God's word. We've gone from people that had a lot of debt um, to people that have no debt at all. Even our house is paid for, and that's quite unusual uh, this time of life um, for us. We've gone from uh, having ambitions for a a huge house and nice cars and all kinds of fancy things 
to a people that has a large family. You know, instead of having, you know, a typical one point, however many children people have, uh, we have eight, you know, and God is blessed in that area. Uh, we've gone from party animals to people who, um, to who love to go to church. We've gone from people who love to party to people who love to read about the Lord and read the Bible and, and teach our children. So um, those are just some contrasts um, that, uh, you know, pre-salvation, post-salvation things, and we'll go into a little bit more detail on those things. Um, so uh, as I mentioned, you know, Tamara and I both were raised up in, in um, the Catholic Church and religious families that, you know, didn't talk a whole lot about God, but uh, went to church on Sunday and just were nice to people. We tried to be nice to people and, you know, um, had a lot of fun, but uh, just re really religious, you know. And, um, and uh, it was when I went to college that really caused me to go from being um, believing in some sort of a God, the God that the Catholic Church teaches about, to being an atheist, because it's amazing how much evolution you get taught in college. You know, we both have a bio, or I have a biochemistry degree, Craig has an environmental chemistry degree, and um, all four years of college, it caused me to be more and more of an atheist and just believe in evolution, that there was no God at all. And it's amazing in that environment, that's what the Lord used to get my attention. And that's part of the reason why I believe it's the Lord and only the Lord that can reveal himself to people. You know, sometimes we spend so much time trying to talk to atheists or convince them of the existence of God. Only God can do that. You know, I was in my senior year in my biochemistry class my professor was atheist. My book was completely evolutionistic. And the girl that I studied with was a Muslim. And I just remember the professor talking about uh, the primary and secondary and tertiary and quaternary structures of molecules. And he was showing them and I was just looking at all that and I thought, wow, there is no way this could have all just came to be. There has to be a God out there. There's no way that this could just have happened. And I looked over to my friend and I said that to her. And she said, Tamara, I know there is a God. And that's what began my search. The Bible says, if you seek me diligently with all your heart, you will find me. That's when I began to seek God diligently with all my heart. And he did reveal himself to me. Right. And in the background, I, I you know, I, I was being taught the same things. And I was going and... and um, in the same direction as Tamara, and um, and uh, but you know, in the back of my mind, I, I kind of knew that this all couldn't have happened by accident, and um, and so both of us were just kind of in the limbo. Kind of, I would I would say I was like atheist agnostic kind of person. But um, we met in the summer of '92. We uh, we met at a bar, and. Um, and as I mentioned, all through college, while this teaching and this learning was going on and these kind of wrestlings were going on, we were just partying and having a great time. Yeah. I have to interrupt him. We <laughs> met at a bar, and I grew up in a very strict family. We were not, I wasn't even allowed to talk to boys, and I always thought, Although I did go to bars with my friends just to have fun, I said, I will never date anybody I meet at a bar. And I didn't, but I ended up marrying the one person that yeah. I met at a bar. So that's just another way that God showed me, Tamara, don't never say never because you just don't know what I'm going to do. And, you know, it was just amazing. But anyway, not that I recommend that. <laughs> yeah. And my first words to her were, come here. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I came. <laughs> yeah. She smiled at me and I got, I already had, I had drinks and I had some courage there. Mm -hmm. And between drinking and her smile, the those words came out of my mouth from nowhere. <laughs> and here we are. Yeah. But anyway, um, so we met right before her sophomore year, or right before my sophomore year. It was right before she started. Went to University of Michigan and Flint, and um, and yeah, we we uh, went to school together. We 
we had these wrestlings, as we just mentioned. And then we got married. Four years after we met in 96, we got married. And, um, you know, we were, uh, you know, we were still pretty much the same. We started to get jobs. Um, we uh, had a lot of fun. We were, you know, when you get first get married and you're alone together, I mean, there's plenty of opportunity to be in trouble and to do, to do things that aren't necessarily good for you. But, um, uh, and we had problems when we first got married. Um, she was seeking to be, um, I guess, uh, to rise up within the ranks where she was working. She was working at General Motors in an assembly plant, really great environment <laughs> for a, a pretty young lady. And um, she started, eventually she got to the point where she had her own company working contract for GM, uh, making um, $8,000 a month through the company. And, um, and that I was, was clear money. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And, you know, I was making some money, you know, and between the two of us, I mean, um, all together, we were pulling in about 11 grand a month. And so our ambitions for money and things and prosperity were, uh, were starting out pretty, pretty, pretty good. And, um, you know, we, we kind of went to church. We didn't go every Sunday, but uh, we eventually got to the point where we were kind of going back and forth from Baptist to Catholic church because Tamara's parents had become born-again believers. And uh, they were going to a Baptist church, and they were starting to talk to us, and more so, I think, to Tamara. I remember, I remember them specifically coming and trying to talk to me, um, and get me and bring me into a Bible study. And all I remember is is doing that and going downstairs and telling them to take a hike, you know. Yeah. But um, but uh, you know. God started working with her parents and then uh, with her as her parents began to talk to her. And you moms out there that have um, wayward children, I basically would scream and yell at my mom every time she would talk to me about the Bible. Um, I did not want to hear it. I felt like she was part of a cult. I felt like hmm. this church took my mom from me. You know, I used to be the center of my mom's life. Now I'm not anymore. God is. And, and, um, and it was so hard for me. And then every time my mom would talk to me, I would just yell and scream at her. And I'd make her cry. And then I would go in my car and turn on the Christian radio station. And I did that for two years. My mom never knew that her seed was falling on good ground. So never give up if you have a wayward child. Never give up. Mm -hmm. Never. It doesn't matter. You're not, you're not here to try to keep this false peace. Thank God my mom didn't attempt to keep a false peace. You know, otherwise, my yelling and screaming, part of that made me feel guilty. And then I'd sit there and think, what if she's right? What if I'm doing all this and she's right? So that's what began. I, that's what the Lord used to save me. I actually got saved through a Christian radio station. I just remember being in my car listening to that Christian radio station, and that's how I came to know the Lord. Yeah, so we lived in an apartment for the first year of our marriage, and um, it was it was very rocky. She mm -hmm. was as she was trying to move up in the ranks. She was spending a lot more time at work and with coworkers than with me. And I remember I'd find myself at a bar by myself, drinking a beer, kind of um, you know crying in it, and. Um, in the meantime, as I said, we would go back and forth. Uh, we would go to Catholic Baptist churches. Eventually, we bought a house after our first year. Mm -hmm. And um, and then when we first started going to churches around our house, about 10 minutes from our house, there was a Catholic church. And then right across the street was a Baptist church. And um, we, we found ourselves going to this Baptist church every other week. And um, it was... It was a uh, very good church in relation to the faith of the people there. And they really had an emphasis on the gospel and going out and giving the gospel. And, um, and so uh, I remember one day, and I think it was shortly before I got saved, you, I was in the house, and you came home, and you had gone to church. I think I stayed home. Mm -hmm. And she came home with wet hair. Mm -hmm. because she had been baptized mm -hmm. in a Baptist church. 
Um, was it at what is it? Was it at, at Lake, Lake Crest? Crest yeah. yeah, I didn't go that day, and I remember, oh man, this woman is off of her rocker. <laughs> what on earth is she doing? And it bothered me, you know. But uh, you know that passed, and um, we we kept doing that. We kept going to um, one week Catholic church, one week Baptist church. Well. Um, there was a Thursday night where the pastor of the Baptist Church came to our house. We were behind the house on the patio, drinking. I, was, I had a beer, and we were blasting music. And um, he obviously had knocked on the door and found that we weren't going to answer the door because of how loud the music was. And um, he ended up coming around the back of the house through all the... We had just put sod in, and and the you have to really water it good. And he came around, and he was... He was like walking through the swamp, you know, but he made it down in his suit <laughs> and, and we talked to him a little while. I don't even remember everything that was said, but all I know is that the following Sunday, um, he preached a message about, you know, and I think it was the beginning of John at the beginning of John where Jesus was going around and, and, um, the, some of the disciples were, were saying, Hey, we found the Christ. We found the Christ. And he said, come and see, come and see. And all I remember is him saying, come and see, come and see, over and over again. And in between that, he was obviously preaching the gospel of, of Christ. And um, he, at the end of the message, he asked, you know, if, if you don't know you're saved, uh, raise your hand if you have no, you know. And I raised my hand. And, um, and uh, it uh, was inevitable that I would go forward that day. I went forward to the front of the church at the end of the service and uh, a man sat down with me and gave me the gospel. And um, all up until that point, being ra raised in a religious family, I had believed that you work your way to heaven. That you you have to kind of get there by your own deeds and your own striving. And um, it was when the man opened the Bible to Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. And there it says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It's a gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. I, every time I go back to this, I want to cry. But that, that was the most amazing revelation, and it was a revelation um, to me in my entire life. And nothing was going to stop me from calling on the Lord for salvation. All I could think of was the love. Wow, I, I remember thinking, wow, he did that all for me. So I don't have to do, I don't have to strive and wonder, you know, where do I stand? I stand on a rock now. I stand on Christ. And at that moment, God put me on that rock. And I thank God for that. And, um, and immediately the guy went to Acts 2.41. They, they that gladly received his word were baptized. And all I could think at that moment was, um, I had one foot back here, and I had one foot going forward. And, and the foot back here was saying, you were baptized as a baby. You don't need to be baptized again. And this foot said, you need to follow the Lord, you know, and go and be baptized. And um, I got up. And I went back, and I got baptized, and I remember walking into the baptismal um, and looking out and seeing Tamara, and she, she had her face. <laughs> she she freaked, She had a freaked out look on her face, like a very surprised look. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, and I got baptized. I wasn't doing it for her, but uh, uh, I was doing it because the Lord had graciously saved me. And... Um, and that was, that was the beginning of, of a new life for us. You know, Bible says, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And um, I can think of the first time really the Holy Spirit prompted me concerning my, uh, my moral life. Um, it was, I think it was a week later. I was in the car and I was cussing out somebody in the car. Uh, they had done something wrong to me. It's always other people that do the wrong things on the road, right? I never do anything wrong. And I was cussing somebody out, and I remember looking down at my radio dial. I mean, this is just what flashing back, and 
and the Holy Spirit prompted me, you know, you, you really shouldn't talk like that. And you shouldn't have that kind of an attitude. And, you know, that that was the beginning of the, the change of my foul mouth. Um, I had a very foul mouth. We won't go into the details there, but now I speak these things because the Lord changed me. Amen. And, you know, our, um, we, we've been through so much, but I think we're a living testimony that God's ways really do work. Um, even after we got saved, honestly, our marriage didn't get better for about 10 years. Hmm. And that's a whole nother video in itself, yeah, what and, the and, Lord and, has done. And the marriage problems weren't because, you know, somebody was going to the bar and getting wasted. No. A lot of them were because um, somebody like myself would spend so much time on a, on a forum speaking about Christian doctrine with people. And I would neglect her. I would neglect the family. So there were different uh, things that, you know, sometimes we, we take the Lord's work and it, it becomes something that's, we begin to do it on our own strength and um, we forget our family you know that's the kind of thing that was going on with us yeah it was it was very hard because we had you know we were homeschooling and all these children and building a house and yeah. it, it was just crazy but God in his time sanctified us and is still sanctifying us little by little but I believe that you know God wants to bless his children that obey him through his word because he wants the world to see that his ways work. They really do work when you truly seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness. He does add all these things unto you. And we're living proof of that. And it's not anything that we've done or because we're, you know, we're we're no nobody. I mean, we're just ordinary people that have a lot of faith in an extraordinary God. And it's amazing what the Lord has done in our lives. Yeah. You know, and I, I, I continued. I, I didn't, we didn't do the partying that we did, but we did. It was, it was kind of funny. One little story that um, uh, you know, we didn't think drinking was wrong as far as like, no. you know, excessive drinking and all that. And, and, you know, gambling, what was that? I mean, we're not killing anybody, right? You know, that's, and I remember uh, Tamara, um, she surprised me one weekend. This was about six months after we got saved, and she was, uh, she bought some tickets and she set it up where we would go to Vegas, and um, she was telling people at church about it, like, yes, "Wow, was. you know, you, you can't believe what I'm going to do for Craig," you know. And um, you know, she <laughs> she said she said what she was going to do, and uh, nobody was happy. Yeah, nobody was happy understand. for her. Yeah. But they weren't gracious. They, yes. didn't, they didn't. They could have brought the gauntlet down. You wicked person, you know. Yeah. But they didn't do that. They they knew that we were new believers and that we still had, uh, you know, sanctification is a long process. And um, you know, it's a. Uh, you know, it took a while for us to to kind of get rid of our you know real fleshly carnal partying times. Um, but um, yeah, it's it's been a long process. That's kind of a funny story. But it over time, you know. Um, you know, I remember I, th I would give ten dollars a week. I'd go, ten dollars. Wow. <laughs> yeah. You know, and eventually it became more and more. And we we've become much more generous people. I have to admit, I, I have the gene that you just keep it all for yourself. And I, I've always had a hard time being a, a giver. I I was raised with a dad that loved four letters: S A L E, sale. You know, and just. <laughs> hold on to everything that, that he could and uh, the furniture in their house I think their furniture is from like you know 1842 still <laughs> you know and uh, so they don't they just don't you don't spend money you don't give money you just keep it and um, keep as much as you can and so um, you know our generosity has definitely changed over time we've been able to help a lot of families you know, help a lot of missionaries yeah. you know giving to like world vision and these sorts of things, you know. So um, God has has is trying to keep us to where we're holding on to these things loosely. That's right. And I I would like to share what happened. Um, the first message we heard the pastor in our first church teach on tithing, we kind of looked at each other and said, "Okay, we need to do this because we hadn't studied God's word for ourselves. We didn't know and." Um, 
And, you know, if it's in the Bible, then we have to do it. And I remember talking, we were talking about tithing. And so we started tithing. And for us, you know, we were making a lot of money. So that was kind of a lot of money to be tithing. And, and I just remember um, because the Lord wanted us to do it, we did it. And that, that first Sunday that we gave our money, the following Tuesday, my boss came to me and out of the blue gave me a raise that was bigger than our monthly tithe. I mean, it, it was amazing. I just think the Lord blessed that just to show us you're in the right direction. You know, it was his little wink at us. And I was making even more money than I had made previously. And I had the privilege of working out of my house three days a week. Yeah. So it was amazing how God was just, you know, blessing our direction. Yeah, and we don't we understand you we're not giving to get. Um, no. It's just yeah. when you give it with a pure heart before God and you're not He you're, adds you're all these things up to you. He, you know, he, he blesses. So mm -hmm. God blessed and um, so uh, you know that area of our life um, is uh, very important, you know, and we've heard a recent song um, called Simple Living, excellent song by Keith and Kristen Getty and one of the one of the verses in there that that really struck us was it's not what you give but what you keep. Amen. That's what the Lord is counting. Um, mm -hmm. Just like the widow's mite that she gave, she outgave everybody, even though she gave the smallest gift. And so, um, it's we need to good. remember it's all his. Yep. It's all his. Yeah. Nothing is ours. Our children are his. Mm -hmm. My husband is his. You know, yeah. I used to idolize my own husband. It was so hard on our marriage, and I had to give him back to the Lord. Yeah. His. It's yeah, amazing. We, we've had other, stuff. yeah, we've had other things, you know, with our children, you know, we, we, obviously we, um, we didn't have the, the ambitions for, um, a house changed after we mm -hmm. had our third child. Um, we, we together and, and I, I led the, the charge that she would stay home mm -hmm. and we would homeschool. And, um, and so that huge salary went away. It was gone. We had to sell our house. Eventually, we had to sell our house, but that was, uh, God was obviously with us because mm -hmm. we, we built a house, um, and we built it for the purpose of selling it. Um, in selling it, we made, we had some money in our pocket, and we bought a house with cash. And then after that, we bought this house with cash. Uh, and, um, you know, I can tell you a whole lot more details about that, but through the process, we become totally debt-free. And so... Uh, that being able to give more, you know, mm -hmm. and, um, you know, I've, I've gone through the struggles of, you know, when you have more, you tend to want to keep it. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's, that's been a struggle of mine. And, um, but uh, God has blessed in that area as well. And as, as we've had more children, um, we've been trusting the Lord with that. Um, a big family, uh, homeschooling. And, um, you know, at one point in our child bearing years here uh we you know she's had all c-sections mm -hmm. and um after the sixth one i said that's it you know and uh, she had her tubes tied while they were doing the c-section and after a couple of years um, conviction um came over us and um you know there's a lot of <laughs> there's so much we can say I but know. eventually the, the <laughs> money came in interestingly um, yeah. For us to be able to get a reversal, because insurance won't pay for that. It's about six grand, and the money that came in was right about what we needed. In fact, it was pretty much exactly what we needed. Yeah. And um, had the reversal. Two weeks later, we uh, found out we were pregnant. Um, the day we closed on the actually, house. it was a month later. Yeah, yeah. whatever. It doesn't matter details. But yeah. um, you know, and then God blessed our direction on selling the house, and um, we were able to get out of it, and um, we had our seventh child. And then recently we had our, our eighth uh, in October of 2012. And so, um, and so you can see the, the change from wanting a, a huge house. And I, I pictured myself in Mercedes and having people look at me and say, wow, man, that guy's young and he has a nice car. Boy, it must mm -hmm. be something else, you know, mm -hmm. and now, and now instead of that, uh, we don't go around showing off our kids, but let me tell you something, when they see our family, they don't see me in the Mercedes and say, wow, he's a, they see, wow, what something's different about them. Amen. And it gives opportunity for us to minister and give the gospel like you've never, like you've never seen. I mean, it's awesome. Amen.
Yeah. I just met a woman um, when I was in the hospital with my son, uh, our son, at, at, in Ann Arbor, and um, she was the supervisor physician on, on the floor. And I was able to witness to her and share my testimony, and God had been working in her heart to become a stay-home mom. So it's just such a blessing, you know, how God can use what he's done in your life to encourage others. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, <clears throat> we could talk for, like I said, days on mm -hmm. this sort of thing. But, you know, those are just some of the highlights. I mean, again, um, our finances, our whole outlook on finances changed. Um, what we say, what comes out of our mouth now has totally changed. As, as you can see, if you can picture me, a hockey player saying every other word, the F word, right? Um, and talking about, you know, raucous stuff and, and um, you know, and uh, our outlook on um, children and family. Um, you know, it's uh, God has just uh, changed us and he's still working on us. We still got a lot of Amen. work <laughs> left in us to do. And yeah. Thank God one day uh, we will be glorified. We will see him face to face and all of this war that's going on in our lives between the flesh and the spirit will be complete and um, we'll be so grateful for that and we'll all give awesome testimony in heaven I'm sure regarding what the Lord has done for us so amen I just pray that this encourages you to let you know it doesn't matter where you begin your walk with God he wants you as you are and it's and God will do the sanctifying God will do the cleaning up your life. Mm -hmm. You know, we don't clean our lives and then come to God. We surrender to God and say, Lord, help me. I'm sick and dying and I'm just a dead man walking and please come in, save me, clean, cleanse my soul and help me to live for you, for your glory. <laughs> and God does, will do that um, so long as we're seeking him diligently. And as I said, we're, we're proof of what the Lord's done. And it's not that... He's finished his work. He still has a long way to go on us, but but we've come such a long way. You know, just looking back, we sometimes we talk to each other and say, you know, how did we do that? Mm -hmm. And then we look back and we think, it was only God that got us through that because there's no way the two of us could have ever gotten through some of the things that the Lord's brought us through. You know, the fact that we're married and we're not divorced. I told my kids, just thank God that, I didn't abort you because I would have had an abortion before I got married had I not, had I found out I was pregnant. It was only by God's grace that that didn't happen. You know, it's only by God's grace that we're married today and we do have these kids. Had we chose to divorce after our second child, six children wouldn't be here. Mm -hmm. You know, I just pray that the Lord uses our testimony to be an encouragement to so many that as much as your flesh doesn't want to do something, if the Lord calls you to do it, just stick it out. God will get you through it. You don't know what's in store on the other side if you just wait on the Lord. They that wait on the Lord, the Lord really will renew their strength. Mm -hmm. So the, the works we now do, we do because we are saved, not because we Amen. want to earn anything for ourselves. As I mentioned, the passage that, that was used to really save me uh, by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves it's a gift of God not of works lest any man should boast and that and then it goes on to say um, that we're saved to be his workmanship a poem um, that comes from the Greek word poema which you mentioned poem we're we're a workmanship of God to bring forth the works that God has ordained um, for us to do and um, so it's by grace we don't work our way to salvation um, we are we we do the things we do because we have been saved Amen. because God has justified us and made us a right in a right standing with God and um, so friend if you don't know that you're saved repent and turn away from sin to Christ as Lord uh, turn away from trying to save yourself uh, and turn to the one who saved you on the cross he did the work for you on the cross and Amen. if you if you call on him and seek after him and believe the gospel, uh, then you will be saved. You will be saved not only from the penalty of sin, eternal punishment, uh, but you'll be saved from the power of sin. And that's what um, this video has been about. God setting us right with himself and then 
saving us from ourselves. Amen. And the power of sin. So I hope and pray that was a blessing. Uh, it was a little over a half hour. Channel, this is Mimi. Um, one of the first topics that I wanted to talk about uh, was my relationship with God and how that came about. So um, this is going to be my uh, salvation testimony, I guess you could say. Um, so a little bit of history. Uh, growing up, I loved going to church. Uh, I loved going to church. And it seemed like nobody else did. Like, I felt weird that my cousins and sisters and stuff like that didn't really, like, feel church. You know, they would prefer to stay home. But I really did love it. Um, we went Sunday, of course. Um, Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Uh, if there was any type of function, uh, any type of church picnic, anything, we were there and I loved it. I would never tell them that, but I really did. I really loved going to church. So, and we went to church for a while, probably from elementary to sophomore year of high school. And then we stopped going. And that really hurt me. Like, I really loved going and when we stopped I was like angry about it you know I really loved going um my first I, I don't want to say encounter with God but the first time that I ever recognized that I needed God in my life was when I was 12 years old and we were there at church for a prayer meeting and so normally you're down there and your parents and stuff are praying but we were just kind of messing around, you know, messing around, playing, goofing off, stuff like that. Um, but the pastor, while the praying was going on, he was reading a scripture um, in Psalms. And I, I don't know uh, which one it was, but I remember him reading Psalms. And one of the verses said, um, Do not let thy words depart from thy heart. And that could have been, you know, a, a snippet of it. I, I don't even remember if that was the whole thing. But as I was kind of half playing around um, and half praying, that really caught me. And I stopped and I, I told God, you know, I know that my life is probably going to go in a way that you know isn't pleasing you and I didn't say that in my prayer but I was just thinking you know whatever comes about in my life please don't let your words depart from my heart and I really did mean that with everything so fast forward we stopped going to church um, and then I went off into the army and from the time I joined the army up until I gave my life to Christ I did not go to church for as much as I loved it um, the love for it, you know, kind of wore off and I stopped going. I didn't go at all. I mean, like, I didn't go for Christmas. I didn't go for Easter. Everybody go to church on Easter. I didn't go. And I, I got to a point where I didn't even feel bad about not going to church. I really didn't go. And, um, maybe two years before I gave my life to Christ, you know, I thought about it. You know, I probably should get back in church, but I, I never made the effort. Um, so, when it all came about for me, when it all came about, about three or four months before I actually gave my life to Christ, uh, I was feeling a tugging from God, a pulling from God saying, you know, you you know what you should be doing and you have to get your life right. You know, but I was afraid to. I was afraid of, you know, the hardships that would come. I, I never grew up believing that giving your life to Christ would be, you know, a breeze. I knew that you would have trials and tribulations. I knew that the devil would tempt you, you know, more so because you are now living your life according to God's word and that was hard for me so I was afraid to I was afraid to do it um, and then not only that but I was afraid as to how it would affect my marriage you know I, I can't lie I was afraid as to how it would affect my marriage because my husband and I uh, 
we weren't in church. We never went to church. Um, we hung out together, party, drank, smoked, da, 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 you know, did all that stuff. And I didn't know how me giving my life to Christ would affect um, my marriage. And then also, my husband felt like the people of the church were hypocrites, you know. Um, he he, um, he felt like they were were hypocrites. They they said one thing in church and did something different, and he felt that from you know personal experiences. So I was afraid that he would think, you know, me going to church would change everything. I was afraid that it would change everything, and I didn't want that, you know. And it came a point where. I told God, like, I know you're for marriage, you know, I know you're for marriage. And if I don't um, give my life to you, it's because I want to keep my marriage. As silly as that may sound, that's what I felt, you know, I want to keep my marriage. And I was like, God, I know you made marriage and you're for marriage and I don't want to lose my marriage. So, you know, I can't do this right now. And I really was afraid. I was afraid of the strain that was caused us. Um, I was afraid that, you know, me start going back to church and living my life for God and reading the word and him doing things totally different. Him living the way we always had lived. And I was afraid that it would just cause a distance between us, which would probably eventually lead to, you know, separating away from each other not physically but emotionally just like not being there for each other and you know that could eventually lead to a divorce and I was afraid of that so for a while I put it off um, and then one day while watching videos the YouTube videos you know and I'm sitting there and I'm drinking and I found myself having to drink more just to even get buzzed like I had to make my drinks a lot stronger just to get buzzed and even still I didn't even really I didn't want to drink I didn't want to but I did it because it made me feel good and I wouldn't have to think about you know God telling me to get my life right um, so that night or early in that morning when I went to go to bed I just kind of rolled over on my side and was like, okay, you know, let me just say this little quick prayer and, and go on about my way. And then I heard, uh, I don't know if it was the Holy Spirit or, or God telling me, you know, if you're going to do this, do it right. And I got up out the bed and I got down on the floor and, you know, I just kind of started saying, you know, God, I know I need you. And eventually, when I quit, when I stopped holding on and try to predict everything that I was going to say and just let it flow, I confessed every sin that I could ever think of that I ever committed in my life. And I said, God, you know, I'm miserable. I really am miserable without you. Like, before I gave my life to Christ, my husband would say, you know, what's wrong with you? You have an attitude like every second. You snapping off on everybody. What's wrong with you? And that was truly it. I was, I was, it was a spiritual warfare. It was a spiritual battle going on within me. And I just thank God that he, you know, he brought me to that place. Because if I never would have got there, I probably never would have gave my life to Christ. So, um, I just thank God for that. Um, he saved me right there on that floor in my room while I was drunk. He saved me right then. And um, my life has never been the same. And I, I thank God for it. And, you know, the fear that I had, God didn't let it come to fruition because the next Sunday I went to church. The Sunday after, my husband attended. And me, my husband, and our children go to church faithfully. And, you know, I just... I just thank God for where he's brought us. I thank God for what he's doing in our life. And I don't want to make this video too long. But that's, you know, my salvation testimony. And 
I, I just pray that if you see this video, if you're if you're struggling with wanting to give Christ your life and give him your heart, it is the very best decision. You will Hey everybody, welcome to Martis Ministry. I'm Purvi and I wanted to share a testimony with you guys today. And it's long overdue. I've been meaning to share this testimony and get it out. And just, it's so inspirational. Keep on praying for your unsaved loved ones. I'm going to share about my grandma and a testimony about my grandmother. And thank you to all of you who were praying for my grandma many months ago when I sent out an email chain. Um, thank you for all of your prayers. So I just want to share the testimony. So. Okay, basically to start, I am the first to be a Christian and a disciple of Christ in thousands of generations of each side of my family. My family is all Hindu, and so that includes my grandmother. She was Hindu for all of her life, and um, there was a lot of opposition um, when trying to witness to her, and there was there was different struggles, but... Um, I had always tried and it just it didn't work or she's too sleepy and she also had dementia she was in her last stages of cancer um, in, in a hospice when um, when I was called to go over there so basically so she was in the last stages of cancer she's in the hospice and I'm trying in different ways to witness her turn it just doesn't work out either she's too sleepy or there's opposition like in the flesh there's opposition or something's always it's never right, but I was praying for her every day, and due to um, an illness that, that I was dealing with and also some contagious stuff that was in the hospice, I was not visiting her every single day um, at the point when I was praying for her every single day, but I wasn't seeing her in the, physically every single day at the point when 4 o'clock in the morning the Lord wakes me up, and I didn't know that it was what was going on. This is the first time I really heard from the Lord, so I woke up. And I'm the type of person that when I'm sleeping, like a circus can be going through the room and I'll just be <laughs> snoring away, you know. But this was so different. That's why this is really remarkable is I went from deep sleep to wide awake in one second. And I knew it was the Lord. And I just said, Lord, what is it that you want me to do? Do you want me to read your word right now? I mean, I wasn't even thinking about my grammar or anything. And... Um, he spoke to me he says my sheep will know my voice and he spoke in a very it was a loud thought and it said clearly go to grandma go to grandma and I remember being like wow okay got it got it Lord okay so later on that day I mean I didn't get that I need to go right then but that day so later on that day I go in now every single day it's 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 always difficult for me to go and witness her because there's I'll just say different opposition with people and um, but this day it was orchestrated so that I was able to go alone which never normally happens and I didn't know that at the time um, that he told me to go so I was able to go and witness to her alone which was a huge makes a night and day difference in being able to talk to her and she had d dementia so as I mentioned so she was like out of it a lot of times and she wasn't n always there she could be very sleepy and she wasn't very coherent many many times most of the time with her memory and stuff but this day I went in I walk in it was lined up so perfectly I walk in alone with this opportunity to witness to her as the Lord told me to do I walk in there she's perfectly coherent hallelujah hallelujah she was perfectly coherent able to receive what I had to tell her I told her my testimony and in an amazing way she was so touched that she when I told her all this stuff she said thank you thank you and I said I call her Ma, I call her Ma, I said, Ma, I'm telling you the truth, I'm telling you the truth as I told her the gospel message and about receiving the forgiveness of Christ and she said, I thank you because I know it is the truth. And this is an amazing thing for a woman who's been Hindu her whole life to say this and she started praising the Lord with me as I sang to her, she wanted to join in this little Indian woman in the bed week as I start singing praises to the Lord, I start singing and I just start worshiping the Lord. And she says, she says, can I join you? She says, can I join you? I want to sing too. And she lifts up her little hands in the air and she starts wor worshiping the Lord. She was singing, Jesus. She was singing with me. And there we were, a miracle taking place of what the Lord just did 
amazing, amazingly touched her heart. And she was just, she just had this peaceful feeling and it was an amazing time. And I, I couldn't believe that this was really being received and how everything lined up perfectly. <laughs> He's so good. I mean, his ways are so amazing and that he used me to be able to witness to her. And that was one of the last times that I saw her before she passed away. And, and I just have so much peace knowing that I know that I'm going to see her again at the resurrection. And, and I was praying so hard every day for her salvation and I didn't know how it would come. And I was just so afraid that she would die without knowing the Lord. And then this happened and I just am so grateful to God and I want to, and I know my brothers and sisters out there that your heart hurts so bad for your unsaved loved ones as mine does too for my family members and others that are not saved but do not give up hope because God can work work in mis mysterious miraculous ways that we can't understand and um, and he truly did in the instance of my grandma and I have faith and I keep on praying and I keep on praying for the other ones too that my other loved ones and so just hold on hold fast I wanted to inspire you and bless you with that today because sometimes it can seem like you know, do you really hear me, Lord? Do you really hear me? But in His timing, and he, let His will be done. And so, don't give, don't give up. Keep on preaching His word. Keep on going out there and shining your light and spreading the good news. And you never know how it can save, how it will be able to touch a soul and lead them to the Lord that they may be saved. So, I just want to inspire you guys with that. I love you all. God bless you. You're crying for them, come back home And all your children will stretch out their hands And pick up the crippled man Father, we will lead them home Father, What a blessing it has been to hear these precious folks sharing what God has done in their lives. You know, this Jesus, he's probably the most controversial person in all of creation. At least down here on this planet. People use his name as a swear word. I've done that. Didn't have a clue that I was offending God by using his name as a swear word. Well, perhaps you've been flipping channels and you're not sure what you're watching. This is the Precious Testimonies broadcast. You can learn more about us by going to our uh, ministry website. That should pop up there at the bottom of your screen. Uh, if you can't see that, it's just www.preciousTestimonies.com and you'll go to our website. If you punch that up on the internet and you'll be able to read uh, many, many other Jesus glorifying testimonies such as what you've heard on this broadcast. Also, there are other video testimonies you can watch and there are Christian writings on the website. So there's uh, various spiritual resources for people uh, to uh, help in their relationship with God if they go to the website. We encourage people to pray about getting in contact with us. Uh, if they want to have their written testimony published on that website and or if they would like to uh, have their video testimony connected uh, to these broadcasts in any particular way why we want to see what God uh, would want to do okay regarding that uh, issue 
My friend, as we uh, move to the end of this broadcast, I just want to address those of you who may be watching this and you are wondering more than maybe ever before about this one called Jesus. What do I do about this Jesus? What am I expected to do by God regarding Jesus? Or is this Jesus what is the thing or person that I'm missing in my life? In fact, my friend, you might be in a place right now where you're so discouraged with life that you would, you're close to probably wishing it would end. Or maybe you wished it would end a long time ago. Or maybe you're so frustrated you don't know which way to turn. Well, I want to encourage you, my friend, consider what I'm about to share with you. None of us know when our heart is going to stop. God can give us that desire real quick to be done with this life. And the New Testament Bible says there's two places that we're going to go ultimately once we die. One group of people will spend eternity with the Creator, God Himself, and they will experience joy forevermore. The other group, the Bible says, is a broader group. Many more people will go this way. They will be separated from their Creator, their God, for eternity once judgment has been pronounced in their lives. And they will spend eternity away from God. They will be in hell, a place where they're not only separated from God, but they will know for eternity they could have had the other eternity. That other eternity where a few chose the only way that God has provided for humanity to be right with him. That other way is through none other than Jesus Christ.